Hello, everybody. This is Carol Maletta. Welcome to the Parenting 411 Podcast, where we share information parents need from sources they can trust. Hello, and welcome back to the Parenting 411 podcast. Today, we're diving into a topic that touches the lives of just about every family out there, and that's the digital world and our kids. I'm thrilled to have a very special guest with us, Forrest Bronson, the CEO of Digital Detox. Forrest isn't just a leader in digital wellness, he's a parent just like us, navigating the complexities of technology with his two young children. In our chat today, we'll explore not just the challenges of deciding when to introduce phones and devices and social media to our kids, but also how to think about these decisions in a more holistic way. Forrest's unique perspective from leading global initiatives for digital wellness to his personal experiences as a dad will shed light on the positive and the concerning sides of technology. We'll also take a look at his latest project, Camp Light, which is all about helping parents like us tackle this parenting challenge of our time. So grab your headphones and maybe a cup of coffee <laughs> as we unpack the digital world and its impact on our families. So why don't we get started? Welcome, Palm Forest. Yeah, Carol, thanks for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. Yes, me too. So why don't you talk a bit about your role as CEO of Digital Detox and and what led you to up to this point? Yeah, so Digital Detox has a, a really beautiful story. My dear friend Levi started the company in, in 2012, and Levi and I went to middle school together. We navigated high school together, and this is this is before social media and, and cell phones. Really, I'll, I'll age myself a little bit. <laughs> and it, you know, Levi was a visionary. He started the company in 2012 after a life changing experience, and this was before you know TikTok and Instagram as we know. It. This is in this is in the fairly early days, you know, in the big scheme of social media history. But he was seeing just tremendous impacts on society. And the company started very experiential, right? Summer camps for adults and digital detox retreats, very hands-on, tangible um, um, experiences for adults. And the company was growing just at an amazing clip. Levi had a, a major publishing deal, and he died of a brain tumor in 2017 at 32. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we just lost this thought leader, this amazing human. And I was involved uh, as a supporter and friend from day one. I went to the very first retreat. I brought my company at the time to every company type event that they had. And I was just a huge cheerleader. And, and a lot of the learnings that I had from some of those early experiences with digital detox really changed fundamentally how I view the world and view my own relationship with technology. And at the mm -hmm. time I was scaling a digital agency. So I was, um, you know, hands-on all day with tech. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to 2020, I took over the company. My previous company had exited and uh, I took over Digital Detox and we had this big relaunch event sold out around the world. And this was 40 days before COVID sh uh, shutdowns happened. So mm -hmm. um, talk about timing for relaunching a, a live experience company. So the the last several years, we, you know, we took a step back, you know, for a while there, no one really knew when will live experiences be uh, uh, be back. So we've started focusing a lot on, on research and data. And mm -hmm. we started working with schools around the world. And I started traveling around the world to just really understand how technology is impacting all of us. Mm -hmm. We launched, uh, we have, we call it the Dora score. It's um, a self-assessment and it's a, a methodology for determining how much technology is impacting your life. We later rolled that out for schools, a student Dora that's licensed through uh, schools. So we're, we're collecting this uh, database from individuals from over 80, 90 countries now and schools around the world and students around the world to really understand some of the items that are are moving the needle, what's impacting teens, what's impacting parents. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, so, so my focus, you know, we work on a lot of different things. We're starting to get back into live events, but we're focused heavily on schools, parents, and really kind of understanding from a data perspective, well, how is this impacting us? But then how can we also look at the positives? This was a long-winded answer of what we do at DD, but at, you know, at the end of the day, we're not anti-tech. You know, contrary to our name, Digital Detox, we're we're very positive tech. Actually, we're pro-tech, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we want to find the good, the bad, and the ugly, and navigate the bad and and uh, embrace the the good. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I want to pick up on a couple of things you talked about. Like, first of all, bravo to your friend, uh, Levi, who saw where this could be heading. And my husband was that way as well. Uh, I, when he was, he's in telecommunications. So uh, that maybe gave him a little bit of a heads up. But when with all of the social media, like on Facebook, like I joined Facebook in 2009. I know, I, you know, people were already on it before that. But he really almost forecast what's what it has become in terms of the the invasiveness sometimes the um the the platforms the the and how people are can sometimes be more vicious and be uh, behind the screen uh you know than they would be in person in terms of engaging with people he saw all of that and for me i was just like look this is a way for me to stay in contact with my high school classmates with whom i'm very close college graduate school, you know, all of my friends. And what I told him was that whereas before I used to have to have a phone call and, but you would put off, I would put off having the phone call because it needed to be about an hour because I have to catch the person up and they have to catch me up on what they've been doing. So, you know, they, they, were, they really had to plan and make room for this. Whereas now I could tell hundreds of people at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> what's going on with me and not, you know, have to do all of that. And I, and I still love that aspect of it, you know, staying connected with your friends because life is busy, especially when you have children. And maybe you can't always make that phone call, but you can look on Facebook and see, oh, he graduated or, oh, he's in the band now or playing football or whatever. And I think that's, um, that's really nice. But he, my husband did really kind of see how this would really, could potentially, if you're not careful, uh, take over your life. Well, it sounds like you're using Facebook in a, in a positive way. I think, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the original intention was that to, you know, stay connected with friends in this subtle way, but then that turns into, you know, sharing every possible thing, every coffee <laughs> drink that you enjoy, um, every step that you take, and then it turns into this <laughs> toxic environment that, uh, that doesn't add value. So it's, it's sort of spiraled into, I think there's very few that use it in a, in a healthy way anymore. Hmm. Wow. And, uh, Something else I wanted to, we're going to talk about it more, I'm sure, is that I agree with you as well. I'm definitely not anti-technology, but I am all for um, moderation and being intentional about how you use it because it's there. The technology is there. It does a lot of great things for us. So leverage it by all means, but no, don't let it run your life. And it sounds like that's where you all are as well. Uh, how about um, as a father? Uh, how how does that uh, shape what you're doing with um, digital detox? Well, yeah, and your your comment you just made that I, I agree completely. Sometimes that's easier said than done, right? You know, finding that balance, uh, leveraging it in a healthy way, putting it down when you need to on paper. Yeah, that's that sounds great, but in practice, most people really struggle with that. So yeah, on the parenting side, like that that's where I'm wildly passionate. My kids are let's see, fourth grade and first grade, nine and seven. And, you know, I, I've seen it from a very early age in the parenting community, right? So whether it's modeling behavior that doesn't seem quite right, or whether it's too much shaming going on and not having empathy towards other situations to mm -hmm. just this, just this cluster of confusion around, you know, protocol, what's the best time to introduce this? Should we allow them to have an iPad? what content's okay. There's just at every age is the parenting challenge of our generation. At every age, there's something that comes up with parenting from when they're born and have their <laughs> first experience with a screen to when they're through high school and beyond, there's something that parents are, are, are struggling with. And th this is universal. This, this isn't, uh, it doesn't matter if you're wealthy or poor or where you live in the world. Th this mm -hmm. is a common parenting challenge. And so, yeah, Digital Detox, we recently launched a program called Camp Light that helps kind of parents navigate all this and think through some of these decisions. It's not black or white. It's 
it's more nuanced than, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we'll get into this, what age to get a phone. That's, uh, uh, that's too complicated to answer with one specific, uh, um, one specific number. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really passionate about that just on a personal side, going through this with my kids, but then seeing how many other parents around the world are struggling with this, helping them just think about it a little bit more abstractly and in different ways. Well, I know that's a burning question for parents that are listening. So let's talk about if it's not what age to get a uh, phone or when, or what age should they be allowed to be on social media? What should they be considering instead in terms of making a decision about those things? Yeah, a lot to unpack there. And those are two very different things, social media versus a phone, right? True. And I'm probably not going to earn a lot of fans here with your listeners by saying it's complicated and it depends, right? Everyone, myself included, I would love to be able to give you a specific age, nine, 12, whatever it is. And <laughs> I think anyone that's giving you a specific age is kind of doing a disservice, right? And and here's why. Every child is so different, right? In terms of mm -hmm. developmentally, in terms of their personality, in terms of their overall portfolio of other interactions. So every child is so unique and, and different. Second is what do they want the phone for? That's a huge question. A lot of a lot of parents will immediately react to, you know, no phone, no phone. I would ask them the question, well, what do you want the phone for? And mm -hmm. uh, open up that dialogue. And a lot of times that'll lead down a path that might lead you to say, okay, well, no, that's not a good idea, right? Like I want to have it to go down the deep, dark, web of YouTube and social media at third grade. Okay. Well, no, that's, that's not a great use, but there might be some really healthy uses. Right. Mm -hmm. And so first, what do they want it for? And then second, and then third, sorry, what's the overall community. And, and this is something that we really encourage at a very early age to have these conversations with other parents in your ecosystem, with your, with your grade, with your school, with your community, what's everyone doing? And that's not for the reason of following the Joneses, mm -hmm. right? If, if your friend's doing this, but to try to get on the same page with protocol, right? And the the communities that are more in lockstep with that, we find are more successful. And mm -hmm. you know what happens if there's one or two parents that feel this way, and there's one or two parents that feel this way, and then everyone's all over the map, then it just becomes chaotic in terms of everything, screen time, content they're watching, video games. But the more you could have, you know, this tribe of other parents that really align with your values and how you're going to approach it the better outcome we generally see. And that doesn't necessarily mean deciding on a specific age, we're going to wait till eighth grade to, uh, to do this. Not necessarily. It's more just kind of fundamentals. What are the things that we're concerned about? Let's just have this open conversation and being able to have that dialogue that goes a long way. So mm -hmm. back to your question, I'll try to give a more specific answer. With what age to get a phone, you know, first, what are they going to use the phone for? Second, what's their overall kind of personality? Do they have any kind of developmental challenges that, um, and sensitivities towards uh, kind of more addiction? That would be a, you know, very, very different thing. Um, and then third, like we, we like to look, and this kind of goes into screen time too, and we, we like to look at the overall kind of portfolio of the child. And, you know, I'll give you a screen time example. You know, the same question, like how much screen time's okay? And that, that's an impossible answer too. So I'll give you two examples of two different kids. One kid, they're highly active and involved. Let's say they're playing a sport and they're doing this extracurricular and they're meeting their academic expectations and their nutritional expectations and their interpersonal expectations and their grades are on par. Everything is there and mm -hmm. they need some downtime with screens. Yeah, actually screens could be positive and, and mm -hmm. we need some time of boredom, right? Versus the child that's not meeting their academic expectations or anything else, they're mm -hmm. not exercising, uh, you know, all these other things, th that answer is probably no screen time, right? So it mm -hmm. really depends on the dynamic and portfolio of the child and mm -hmm. what they're going to be doing. Of course, then the content as well. The, the screen time conversation, I know I'm digressing here, used to be all about how much screen time is okay. And it's evolved a little right. bit more to we'll, we'll content over quantity, right? So what are we watching? I'd much rather my son watch three hours of a astronomy documentary than three hours of TikTok, right? We'll be right back after this. If you're looking to reach a massive audience of parents and caregivers, then look no further than Pro Picks by The Parenting 411, the ultimate marketing program designed to skyrocket your brand to new heights. With Pro Picks, we've created three incredible packages to suit your marketing needs and budget. So let's take a look. First up is our social starter package. You'll receive a stunning graphic promo piece, plus we'll also feature your brand on The Parenting 411 Instagram page. 
It's the perfect way to make a memorable first impression and get parents buzzing about your business. Now, if you're ready to level up, our Parenting Pro Package is where it's at. You'll enjoy all the benefits of the Social Starter Package, plus more awesome benefits, including exposure on the Parenting 411 podcast, which reaches parents in more than 22 countries each week. But wait, there's more. For those seeking the pinnacle of marketing power, our Elite Exposure Package is the way to go. You'll get even more exposure across our platform, including thousands of followers and connections on LinkedIn. Get ready to dominate the airwaves and establish yourself as the go-to resource for families everywhere. Take advantage of Pro Picks by The Parenting 411 today and unlock unparalleled marketing opportunities for your business. But I should tell you that prices are set to increase on November 1st, so act now. Pro Picks by The Parenting 411 is your passport to the hearts and minds of parents. Visit ProPicksbyP411.com. Join us today and watch the magic happen. And we're back with the Parenting 411. Right. And that's really what drove the decision for us when our sons, uh, they wanted uh, phones much earlier but we actually needed it uh, because we were thinking of the phone more in its traditional sense for communication. <laughs> uh, when someone is at one, so one family member is at point A and another's at point B, we need to com communicate. And that's how we, um, how we decided because of, you know, of them changing schools and riding the bus and things like that. It was really more of an emergency measure and there was no smartphone, it was a flip phone. <laughs> because it really was about um, the communication and connection, but the, the need drove it. Had that not happened, I don't know. We would have had to, to wait until there was some other need, or we would have had the conversations that you were talking about, like, what do you want to use it for? And that's just so important for parents. I mean, just like with many other things, uh, many other privileges um, and resources and tools that they ask for, these are the kinds of questions we certainly should be asking, especially uh, with phones and devices, because it's a gateway to so much um, other information and to gateway to other people that you might not, you can't control. So you want to make sure your child understands uh, your family's values. You mentioned that, and that is also very important because that drives the content, that drives the sites that they should be able to visit and um, those sorts of concerns. So the values are very, uh, very important. And parents, it's it's overwhelming because they don't, they feel like that it's the unknown. They don't know what's out there. You've got to learn what's out there. And also just the way it's a, it's a digital playground is basically what it is. And we just like the physical playground that we take them to, to, to play with their friends or whatever, we decide how much time they're going to spend there. We can decide how much time they're going to spend on the digital playground too. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I'm more concerned about a digital playground than a physical playground because you could you, you could see everything up and on a physical playground. But I'm with you in terms of the timing. You, you raised an interesting point though, and you know, I was assuming more smartphone. First, ask like, do, what do they want it for? Again, and you know, a, a flip phone is very different than an iPhone, right? And so yeah, if they want a phone to call their friends and that one on a flip phone. Great, I think that's that's awesome. Let's let's get more conversation. That's not what they wanted. That's not what mine wanted, but that's what they got. <laughs> uh, understood, but I think it's still it's still worth the question. But a fourth really important point, and this is what pretty much every parent misses, unfortunately, is they're focused so much on the age, and they decide, okay, sixth grade's the right grade, or eighth grade, or wait till eighth, or whatever it is, and then they just give the phone with no guardrails and no training. I would much rather have a parent give a phone to a fifth grader or even a fourth grader with a lot of thoughtful education and ongoing conversation than a 10th grader and just giving it to them and jumping into the deep end, full stop. Yes, I totally agree with that. And another concern that parents have uh, with the phones is, you know, the bullying, which has really morphed into something altogether different from the physical world. Talk about how bullying has changed um, because of the technology that's available now and how it's impacting parents and, and children. 
Yeah, and I get it. It's it's scary. And you know, that's the number two thing on parents' minds. So when we do large surveys of, you know, what are your concerns about tech and social media and phones, number two is bullying. And that's even before it's happened. So it's they're 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 worried about it when it's not even when it's not even happening. So so a few things. Like one, it's getting younger and younger. I mean, kids on Roblox are getting bullied, on YouTube at a young age are getting bullied. So like, you know, we have first graders, kindergartners that are experiencing cyberbullying, right? So it's happening at a much earlier age. Second is, you know, it's it's just different than it was pre-smartphone, right? You know, pre-smartphone, there's a good chance that a parent or a um, teacher would see something on campus. Like it's a physical interaction. Now, you know, you really can't protect your child when they're alone in their room at night getting cyberbullied. So it's, it, it's just much broader. And I think the third kind of big fundamental shift is, you know, there, it, we call it kind of paper cuts. There's just a lot of small micro bullying that happens, getting right. untagged in a photo, uh, getting unfollowed, right? Uh, little small uh, uh, passive aggressive or semi aggressive jabs, all the way to obviously the extreme, very clear bullying. But, um, you know, the death of a thousand paper cuts, we're seeing that very, very common. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's easy for kids to be mean or anyone to be mean uh, online, right? And that's that's unfortunate. So it, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. And I think another thing that that compounds that is it's complicated with the schools. And this depends on the state and the district and the specific school. But a lot of schools don't want to touch it because right. you know they view it as this gray area of well, did it happen on campus? Did it happen off campus? Uh, pretty much every bullying situation that happens on social media or online is continued in some way or another in person though. So, but it's complicated. Like parents go to the school to intervene and the school just doesn't want to get involved at all. We've even had some cases where a school suggested the child just move schools to solve the problem. So, um, you know, it's, it's a messy area and I empathize with parents going through that. And we work with parents around the world going through that. And it's, we've heard just some really, really sad stories. So it's, it's unfortunate. It's complicated. I think what I will say is, you know, bullying in sort of the dynamics of kids changing and, um, going through these emotional development stages, that's always been, has been around for generations. That's, that's mm -hmm. not new, but what mm -hmm. is new is being able to kind of compound that and being able to use a social device and a tech technology to, uh, uh be even more mean and even hide. And when we get into like anonymous apps on Snapchat, that even takes it to a whole nother level where you don't even know who's bullying you, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's your friends, you know, it's someone that might be in your network, but um, you don't know who it is. So it's it's pretty ugly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in your travels and in your studies, are you finding that there are some school districts that are stepping up to the plate a little more and helping navigate this? Or is it or is it by and large still hands off? It didn't happen here. Uh, it's something parents need to deal with and they're just, just not wading into it. Oh, no, for sure. No, there's some schools that have a very hard policy and most schools will have some policy. It kind of comes down to how much they enforce it, right? But yes, yeah, so mm. some schools, it's a you know zero tolerance bullying and a full investigative process for if there's a report. So yeah, no, for sure. You know, some schools and districts are taking it very seriously. Um, some schools have very strict rules around phone and social media use on campus. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just, you know, what school is doing better because that then kind of comes down to the overall community. How are they starting at an early age? All this starts at a much younger age in terms of modeling behavior as a parent, creating that safe space for your child to to talk to you and uh, and be able to open up about some of these challenges and just how the overall community interacts. But yeah, to answer your question for sure, there's certainly some districts and schools that are doing a better job than others. And I wouldn't put that blame specifically on the school. Sometimes it bubbles up to the district or even the state on how they mm -hmm. how they want to handle these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you alluded a bit to the mental health and social, uh, social and emotional um, impact that uh, technology can have, you know, being counted in or being counted out, the bullying and all of that. There's some other areas of concern that uh, uh, parents have and even professionals have, even for example, uh, vision. Screen uh, the impact on vision that screen time excessive use of screen time can have, and um, also having it in having it in their rooms, looking at it late into the hours of the night, and of course we'll get into sleep as well. That's another big area. 
But what are you hearing from, you know, optometrists, ophthalmologists? What are they saying about uh, the impact of screen time on our kids? Yeah, no. So I, I think the latest study is, and, and I could get back to you on the specifics of it. I think like under age three, there's much more compounded detriments of excessive screen time, just in terms of um, how the eyes and the brains are developing. And yeah, I mean, for any of us, you know, if we spend too much time, that's that's not good for our eyes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not healthy. And, and digital detox, we're not advocating. When I say that we're balanced, we're not advocating to go spend twelve hours a day on a screen. We're just saying. Yeah it's it's probably not healthy to have zero screen time either. And we could get into right. that. The, right. I think the, the the bigger concern I have is with sleep and you, you touched on that. Mm -hmm. And this is something, so in some in some recent data from student Dora, so with students reporting back, something like 90% are scrolling before bed and upwards of 30% are checking notifications in the middle of the night. They're waking up to check, check notifications. It's one of the worst things you could possibly do for your REM sleep. And there's just, there's so much that's going on there. So with how our bodies are developing and how critical it is for that age to get sleep. And we have just endless amount of data on the importance of sleep for our mental health, for our physical health, for our mm -hmm. longevity, for everything. And we also have evidence, you know, very concrete evidence on how phones right before bed or interrupting in the middle of the night impact that sleep. It's really, really bad. Uh, we had Dr. Gupta on um, our show a couple weeks ago. She's a pediatric endocrinologist, and I don't want to speak for her, but the 50,000-foot view is that there's some some new data showing that blue light is impacting melatonin, which then impacts sleep. It impacts the whole endocrine system. Um, we're seeing early onset puberty, um, especially in girls. And it's, um, you know, it's, it, 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 we, and we don't have direct evidence tying that, but there's some very interesting connections and correlations with uh, with screen time. So, but yeah, the sleep is critical where we usually get through to parents on that one is if they have a student athlete, right. And this should apply to anyone, but if you have a student athlete and mm -hmm. they're competitive, losing sleep consistent consistently is, is going to prevent you from reaching your full potential as an athlete. hundred percent. Like you still might be a tremendous athlete. Don't get me wrong, but you're not going to reach your full potential if you're consistently messing up your sleep. And so when we have that clear message to both student athletes and parents, that's kind of a wake up call mm -hmm. for everyone else. That's not an athlete. Yeah. Like it, just tie it to whatever's important to you. Academics, the school play, whatever it is, you're mm -hmm. going to be more focused. So the easiest one there is just no phones in the bedroom. I, I think so. that's one that Levi taught me in 2011 mm -hmm. uh, at the first digital detox retreat. And I've, I've lived by it pretty much every day since. So I think for adults too, and kids, we need to model that behavior. And that should be an easy one for everyone to get on board with. Look, like we could have a different conversation about screen time, what you're going to access content, but let's all agree. There's really no place for the phone in the bedroom for parents and uh, for children with the obvious exception. If you're a physician that's on call, yeah, of course, like you need to be an earshot, but for, for the rest of us, it could probably wait and it doesn't need to be right in a uh, peripheral view. Yeah, that's what we did. We had a, a we parked all of our phones uh, downstairs. Mom and dad and uh, the two sons. We all did that. Uh, I only uh, brought it into my phone. I uh, brought it into my room if everybody was traveling or something like that. And I still, I still would didn't love having it in my room. And. Uh, it's it's kind of stayed, but I don't do anything with it when I go to sleep. I, I would like to move it out of my room again, <laughs> frankly, and and because of what I've been hearing too about the um the blue light and the the uh, that kind of the, the harm that that can do having that close to you or or anything like that while you're sleeping. So. Well, yeah, it's more than the blue light too, like scrolling before bed. So what's going on? Not only are you getting the light, but it, depending on what you're looking at, that's critical, right? Sure. So if you're reading a, a anxiety provoking email or news piece, <laughs> whatever it is, like th that's changing your body and it's changing your anxiety levels. And that's really going to throw off your sleep. So it's not just the light. I mean, the light could be the same as watching TV right before um, bed. Although I'd argue that, you know, a small screen right here is worse than, you know, TV from 10 feet. Uh, but it's more about kind of the con again, like content oh, over what you're doing. But yeah, it, the best practice would be you know, no screens of any kind two hours before bed. Next best practice would be, okay, well, watch a TV show, hopefully uh, 
two hours and wait an hour before bed. Uh, but uh, if at all possible, and I think everyone could probably do this, no cell phones in the bedroom and no looking at the phone. So th that's an important distinction though. Like the one's no phone in the bedroom, but it, it's just as bad if you're in the closet looking at your phone right before you go to bed and then you just move to the bed. So it really should be no screens and no, you know, anxiety provoking activity before bed. And then I agree. A yeah, to accompany that don't have the phone uh, in a uh, reaching shot or earshot uh, within the bedroom. Right. And that and that's what I meant, too, with um, just not having any phone activity um, in the bedroom, because, you know, honestly, even if you were looking at something funny and exhilarating, it just when you're trying to wind down and get ready for bed, that can disrupt your sleep, too. So I, I absolutely get that. Now, how can parents just find a way to have some balance uh, in the digital age and how can they be more mindful and aware of what they're doing? Of, As adults of, or with their children? Um, both um, the yeah. children and the family, because as we talked about, we need to be good role models for how we engage with technology as well. Yeah, it's a, I appreciate you asking that question. And it's it's tough. Look, I get it. I'm a parent. I'm running a company. Like, I'm busy. Sometimes I have to be on the phone. I'm, I'm on the computer a lot. Like, so that's just life. You know, I, I think it's um, unrealistic to, you know, picture the perfect parent that's never on their phone and, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, <laughs> zero screen time. Yeah, it happens. But like, that's really, that's really challenging. So mm -hmm. a, a couple things. One, I think one thing that we've started doing in our household and we, we work with a lot of parents on is explaining when you are on your phone, the reason that you're on your phone. Right. And so, well, let me take a step back first, having those, those clear lines of separation. If I'm in work mode, I'm in work mode. Great. And you know, office doors closed and I'm working. That's, that's, that's healthy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to discourage ambition. And sometimes that could be a good lesson where it's like, yeah, I'm actually, I'm going to work into the evening tonight because I have this big deadline tomorrow or this amazing podcast with Carol I want to prep for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so some of those are good lessons for our children. I think where parents need to be a little bit more careful is where they blend family time and phone time. And this is tricky, but I'll give you an example. If you're like hanging out with your son or daughter and they're young and you're playing Legos or whatever you're doing, it sends a very complicated message if you're checking your phone or notifications while you're with them. One, you're missing that moment. Um, so you're you're kind of missing out on, on those those precious moments that you're not going to get back. But two, you're you're subtly teaching them that it's okay to interrupt some type of interaction because of something else um, that's mm -hmm. coming up. And now there's going to be times that you need to. And in my example, if you know I have a relative that's sick and I'm waiting on a call, I'll explain that to my son or daughter. Look, like we're doing this. I'm not on my phone, but I am going to have to take this call. And I know it's coming sometime in the next hour. So I just wanted to kind of set that expectation. So the more you could communicate and again, like be kind to yourself. Parents make mistakes too. So, you know, if I mm -hmm. pick up my phone and I shouldn't be picking up my phone, I'll acknowledge that sometimes be like, man, like I shouldn't be looking at my phone right now. My bad. I'm going to put it down. Or here's the reason I'm using my phone. Like I'm right. lost. I, I didn't print out a map and I need to figure out how we get to the hotel. That's the kind of the reason. So I think just having more active conversation mm -hmm. is very helpful because we're, we're modeling at such an early age, yes. everything we're doing. Of course, kids are sponges from day one um, and uh, you know, <laughs> through adulthood probably. And so we want to be careful with how we're modeling it. But in addition to that, we want to have that, that narrative and that talk track to educate them and teach them on what we're doing. So that's one. I think two, you know, just just kind of taking a step back and like in the big scheme of things, how, you know, for a parent that's constantly on their phone, like the things that you're doing, are they, do you need to do them, right? And if so, yeah, there might be some work related things that you you need to do. My, my next question then would be, is it is it more efficient? Like, could you be more productive if you have scheduled time for that? So checking email, for example, like it's very rare that we find an individual when we're doing productivity studies that is more productive by just constantly refreshing, you know, every 20 <laughs> minutes on their phone versus uh -huh. I'm going to have, you know, the set time for checking emails. Like there's, there's very few professions where the world is going to end if you don't look at that email within 15 minutes. Right. So, right. and I think you'd be surprised to, to test yourself on that. You're, you're going to be fine. Your company is going to be fine. So having that separation and kind of just really asking yourself, am I more productive with how I'm using my phone? And then on the entertainment side, I think that could be healthy, right? Like, of course, like it could be fun to look at, you know, a, a Jimmy Fallon reel. Great. Um, but 
how much are you actually spending on there for, we call it kind of productive entertainment and how much is, you know, snowballing into the rabbit hole of whatever you're on TikTok, YouTube, um, Google, et cetera. So I think you just need to ask yourself those questions. And I think it's hard for parents to do that and to look at themselves and, uh, raise their hand and say, yeah, wow. Like I'm, I'm actually probably not using my phone in the best way. That's, that's hard for any of us to admit and acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us uh, about your future plans with Digital Detox and Camp Light. We'll be right back after this. Are you a parent looking to unlock your potential in raising confident, capable, and courageous children? Well, look no further. Join us at the upcoming Parent and Purpose Summit Back to School Edition, where parenting experts from around the world will come together to share their wisdom and insights. I'm Carol Maletta, founder of the Parenting 411. This summit is your opportunity to gain essential skills and tools to become the parent you've always aspired to be. Over five incredible days, we'll dive deep into topics like positive discipline, effective communication, mental health, self-care, school readiness, and more. An attendee from our last summit told us, this summit changed my parenting game. I feel more confident and connected with my children than ever before. So secure your seat at the Parent and Purpose Summit today. Visit parentandpurposesummit2023.com. That's parentandpurposesummit2023.com. And click the registration button to join us on this transformative journey. The Parent and Purpose Summit, where intentional parenting begins. And we're back with the parenting 411. Yeah. So, you know, digital detox, like we're, we're focused a lot on schools, parenting, camp light. We just launched a few months ago. It's this experimental project on, you know, essentially can we help parents navigate all of these conversations? And so we're doing that through a camp light umbrella. We're, we're probably going to evolve that all under digital detox just because everything is all interconnected. Um, you know, what we're finding is yes, it's a parenting challenge. And so we focus a lot on the child, but a lot of that circles back full circle to the parent, right? And so just as adults, how do we find our own balance and how do we kind of battle our own tech demons? And that's usually the core issue when it comes to parenting in terms of our fears and our concerns and our insecurities. So yeah, in terms of DD, you know, at some point, will we bring back live experiences? I hope so, because they're so special. They're so meaningful to be able to connect in person. Uh, in the early days, Digital Detox just had these amazing live experiences, unplugged nights and summer camps for adults and Digital Detox retreats. I could see a world that we bring those back at some point. We've just been so focused on making sure that we we get the data right, that we're having these conversations around the world, that we're traveling to understand in the in the real world at a large scale how all of this is impacting us. So yeah, the future of DD and Camp Light, we would just want to continue adding value. And you know, I think at the end of the day, if we could help every parent just make one small change to their habits and think about things a little bit differently for their kids. You know, we feel like we're, we're adding value to the world. Hmm. And so how do you envision the, the evolution of the relationship between technology and uh, family, but just technology and each of us individually, like, for example, I, I, rem- I can remember when I had after school jobs or uh, summer jobs, say working in retail, right? So when there was a slow period and there were no customers, we did things. You tidied up the department, you swept. If you worked in a fast food restaurant, you found other things to do. I don't care what store I walk into now. If it's, if there's nothing going on, no customers to talk to or whatever, everyone young and old are on the phone looking at their phone and it's just, is it going to get better? (laughs) Is this where we are? (laughs) So that's a fair question. And the the, the answer to that, to, well, to your, your, there's um, people are are becoming less comfortable with boredom and that's an issue. And we're, we're not teaching our kids the value of boredom. uh, Developmentally it's healthy to be bored. Right. And you know, in life, there's gonna be a lot of times you're bored and it's so easy to just, you know, turn to the phone when you're bored. And that's, that's not a good cue response to train yourself to just always result to this. Like you need to work on your board. That's hard for a lot of people to work on, to be bored or to do something not on the phone. So 
that there's ways to do it. It just takes work and it takes, you know, the <laughs> desire to, to make it happen and, you know, being really diligent on habits. If, if anyone's really interested in this stuff, read James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. That'll get you mm -hmm. in the right step. It's not a technology book, but right. a lot of the tools there, um, you could really help with, uh, with habit change. It's one of the best books I've ever read on, on habit change. In terms of where we're going as a society, I, I mean, no one knows, right? So <laughs> if you were to ask someone 10 years ago, what's it going to look like in 2024, they probably wouldn't have been able to predict exactly the dynamic of, of how crazy it is. So I have a couple responses to that. One, I'm semi-pessimistic just because like it, it's, I'll tell you this, like I've traveled the world and I haven't found one country or area that isn't impacted, right? I was on the Canary Islands in Spain and this remote, beautiful area. Everyone's addicted to their phones. And it's it's global. So there, there isn't anywhere on the planet that it's really great. I mean, outside of maybe some rural tribe somewhere, but- um, I, Even there, I was going to tell you, in, even in the mountains of Lalibela in Ethiopia, same thing. They have their phones. <laughs> their phones, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, I don't see that, unfortunately, getting better. You know, it's- it's sad and it's complicated, but I don't see that getting better. Where I do see something interesting is, you know, look at the evolution of time. I was talking on another podcast about this in terms of social media, right? So I'll give you an example. It took car companies, I think, decades to implement seatbelts to mm -hmm. save lives, right? And it took to uh, states, I think California took 100 years to pass laws to increase the age of tobacco use, right? 100 years when we had, you know, all of this data on the negative impacts of tobacco. So fast forward to social media in the big scheme of things, social media has been around, you know, 10 years as we know it, you know, call it 20 years since like the very early days, but I wouldn't really count my space as social media of today. Right. <laughs> and, you know, we have dozens of States suing big, uh, big tech. We have advocacy groups around the world. We have legislation being proposed in dozens of States and at the federal level. So the conversation is much faster in the big scheme of history than other things that have had tremendous negative impact. So that leaves me a little bit optimistic that we're going to reach a point in the relatively near future of understanding specifically to social media, the impacts. What's interesting with kids is they, they recognize the impacts, you know, some of our data on the student door, they recognize the impacts on social media, on their lives, like over 65, 70% will say, yeah, I feel my mental health is more, negatively impacted with all the time that I spend on social media, but they just don't stop. They can't stop because there's other reasons that they want to stay connected and it's the world they live in. So th those are two things, one pessimistic, one optimistic. Mm -hmm. But the, the the final thing I'll, I'll leave kind of parents with here, so putting on the parenting hat, is to be careful what you wish for, right? And so if we, if we go back to the 90s, when I grew up, um, you know, I would be talking on the phone a lot on an actual phone to friends for hours a day, a girlfriend, a friend, <laughs> and it would be this constant battle of like, why are you spending so much time talking on the phone? Like, why aren't you going out and doing this and that? And oh my goodness, now ask any parent, they would give a lot to have their kids spend hours talking and having a conversation. Right. And so yeah, I'm not I'm not diluting the impacts of the current state. I'm sure. just saying we don't know what's next. And so right. just just be, be be careful what you wish for, right? Um if we could take that snapshot of 98 of kids talking on the phone, oh my goodness, that would have been a great uh, end game. But at the time in the moment, it was hindsight bias, but at the time in the moment it's it seemed like the world was ending because kids were talking on the phone so much and mm -hmm. computers and AOL was being introduced. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. I think we'll evolve, but yeah, in terms of just society in general and and people, you know, checking their phones at restaurants everywhere, um, I don't really see a world that that's going to change. I mean, that that would just take some massive paradigm shift. I think it's a little too late in the in the cycle for that to happen. Mm, okay. Um, any closing thoughts, and then also share with us how we can follow Digital Detox and Camp Light. Yeah. So I think for parents in general, I would just leave a, a couple thoughts. One, uh, for yourself as an adult and uh, for, for for your children. You know, one thing we really recommend is at the end of the day, just ask yourself, like, was I proud of the time I spent during the day, right? With anything in my life, but especially on technology. And if the answer is yes, great. You're probably in a good spot. More often than not, though, the answer is, well, okay, if I'm being really honest with myself, I probably spend a little bit too much time or a little uh, less efficient time, whether it's on my phone or my, my, my computer. So I'd encourage you to ask yourself that and your children that. 
Second is I'd be kind on yourself. You know, a lot of parents, they stress out about this, myself included, you know, it's a stressful time. Um, but you know, no one's perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. We're kind of going through this together and, uh, just be, be kind on yourself. You know, it's, it's okay. You know, parenting's messy. And so no, no one's going to be perfect. And I think the third is try to be more empathetic to others. I see so much shaming going on with, mm -hmm. you know, judging another parent's decision around this. And we don't know their situation. There's so many things going on in terms of dynamics and co-parenting and everything else. Like I'd be very careful to judge um, because A, no one's perfect, you included, uh, but then B, we really don't know the inside story of, of what's going on and maybe for their dynamic and their situation, whatever that is, looking at the phone or giving them access to this might be a better alternative. So I just encourage a little bit more empathy. Hmm. I thank you for that. And how can we follow Digital Detox and Camp Light? Yeah, digitaldetox.com is probably the best starting point. And we have everything there. You get your free Dora score. You could uh, learn more about Camp Light and uh, keep in touch with what we're doing. Okay, sounds good. Thank you again for spending time with me today. And to our listeners, as usual, I am so grateful that you joined us. And continue to follow us at The Parenting 411 on Facebook, Instagram, as well as YouTube. And if you would like to share this episode or maybe watch it instead of listen to it, you can head on over to our YouTube channel. Of course, that is at The Parenting 411. And again, Thank you for joining. Can't wait to talk to you again next time. And until then, remember that it's never too late to be the parent that you want to be.